Okay. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. So as was described in uh, previous presentations, cancer results from an evolutionary process, and there's different populations of cells called clones that have different mutations, as is shown in the diagram, and this is called intratumor heterogeneity. So this evolutionary process starts with a normal cell, and then mutations occur sequentially on these clones, and that generates an evolutionary tree. So the question is, what can we learn about cancer from these evolutionary trees? Specifically, we can learn patterns across cohorts of patients. So given a cohort of patients, what patterns occur across patients? For instance, which mutations cause or inhibit each other? Are there repeated evolutionary trajectories? So something that really complicates this is the fact that the tree is not exactly determined from the sequencing sample. Instead, there are many possible trees per patient. So in this diagram on the depth, there's the possible trees per patient. And on one hand, this complicates the task of determining the patterns, but on the other hand, it also adds an additional advantage of determining these patterns, because once you understand patterns across patients, it can help you determine which tree is the correct tree for a given patient. And so the main question is, how do we identify these patterns? So there's many approaches for identifying patterns. Uh, some types of approaches find consensus trees across patients. So these are trees that are meant to encapsulate information of many different patients. Whereas other methods, like our method, probabilistically model tree generation. The existing methods for modeling tree generation either assume only linear effects, such as tree MHN, or are uh, impractical on moderately sized trees, such as Hindra. So in this presentation, I'll first describe our model, then the prediction tasks it can accomplish, the results, and finally conclude. So our model, first describing tree generation. So given a clone represented by a, a vector of ones and zeros for the mutations present and absent in the clone, F theta of C comma S predicts the log rates of mutation S on the clone C. So we go from a clone and its mutation to the log rates of mutations occurring on that clone. Then given this function, one can predict the probability of each new mutation on a partial tree. So we started out with the partial tree as just the normal clone. We say what is the probability of extending that by adding the red mutation? And similarly, if we have a tree that has the normal clone and a clone with the red mutation, what is the probability of extending that by adding a blue mutation to the clone that already has a red mutation? So from this, one can assign probabilities to trees. So we can see the tree we've generated has two of these sequential steps, and by multiplying these probabilities, we see the probability of generating that tree. And the methods tree MHN and Hintra use a similar generative process as our method, but with different functions, F theta, to model this process. So specifically, uh, tree MHN uses a linear function. So a nice advantage of this is that it avoids overfitting, but it does not capture nonlinear effects. Um, and the number of parameters is quadratic in the number of mutations. Hintra explicitly enumerates rates for all pairs of mutations and clones. So a really nice advantage of this is it can capture very complicated nonlinear effects, but a disadvantage is because of the exponential number of parameters, it's impractical on moderately sized trees. And the question is, how can we achieve the best of both options? So we use a two-layer neural network with a small number of hidden neurons. Uh, this is nonlinear, so it can cap capture the effects of combinations of mutations behaving nonlinearly. Yet at the same time, it only has a linear number of parameters in the number of mutations. So it's very resistant to overfitting. And the neural network, as shown in the diagram, again, takes in a clone represented by a vector of ones and zeros and outputs the log rate of mutations on that clone. So you introduce CLOMU. It's called CLOMU because it's clone to mutation. It's a neural network-based model of tree generation. It's trained via reinforcement learning, and it accomplishes a wide variety of prediction tasks, including fitness, causal relationships, interchangeability, performing tree selection, et cetera. So first, how do we actually train CLOMU? So the sum, uh, when you sum the probabilities of all possible trees for a patient, that's the probability of the data for that patient. So we can see uh, in that uh, sum in the bottom. And then we take the product across different patients. So here are the sum of all trees for a patient and product across patients, and that's the probability of the entire data set given the model. And that's what we wish to maximize using our neural network. Okay, so then given that objective, how do we train it? So let G be a sequence of mutations occurring on clones generating some tree. This is slightly different than the tree itself because there's many different temporal sequences that can generate a given tree, but this will uniquely generate some tree, just many different possible sequences. So we give rewards to these generative sequences based on how well they fit the observed data, 
So specifically, if you generate, tre if the model generates trees that are uh, very explanative for some patients, we give it a high reward, and if it's not explanative for patients, we give it a low reward. The exact reward is given here, but it's a little bit too mathematically detailed to go over in this presentation. But we have here an equation that's derived in the paper, where as circled in green on the left, we have what we want to optimize. So we want to maximize the probability of the data given the model. And we derived that we can do this by using policy, learn, uh, policy gradients and this specific expression. Um, so in that expression, we take the expectation value over generative sequences. So that is sampling from our model. Uh, each of these generative sequences is, uh, in reinforcement learning terms, um, a sequence of actions taken by the model to generate a tree. And then we increase the probability of sequ generative sequences that have high rewards. Okay, so now we know how to train it, move on to the prediction tasks. So the first thing we predict is fitness. So the clomu predicts the relative rate mutations will occur on a clone. From this, we observe which fit mutations increase the rate of new mutations on a clone. So we can see here, uh, we have a red mutation that's likely undergoing some sort of uh, clonal expansion, and many mutations are then occurring on that clone as it grows because it's highly fit. And in blue, we have a mutation that's not very fit. It's not growing, no more mutations are occurring. Another thing we predict is causal relationships. So by causality, we mean temporal patterns of co-occurrence and mutual exclusivity on a clonal level. Um, and the, pre the question is, does the presence of a mutation S on a clone increase the likelihood of mutation T occurring on that clone? Or alternatively, does it decrease the likelihood or have no effect? And to measure this, we simply look at the rate of, for example, uh, the green mutation when the red mutation is present relative to the rate of the green mutation when the red mutation is not present, and that's our definition of uh, causality. Similarly, we look at multi-mutation causality to detect nonlinear effects. So in this case, we have, a green, so we have a red mutation together with a blue mutation, and we want to see how that affects the rate of the green mutation. So the combination, is there some additional effect of the combination is the question. Another task is detecting interchangeable mutations. So we detect mutations with similar impacts on downstream mutations. An example of this that's well, very well known in the literature are driver mutations in the same functional pathway. So in that case, we have mutations that are generally mutually exclusive because they have the same effect in the same functional pathway and they're completely interchangeable. And here we have a table showing that mutual exclusivity. However, we extend this definition to not only look at uh, in interchangeable mutations that are also mutually exclusive, but we look at, in general, interchangeable mutations and mutations that have similar effects. And in addition to that, we detect, oh, and we detect it using the latent representations in our neural network. So given a mutation, we can generate a latent representation, and we can compare two mutations' latent representations to see if they're very similar and how they affect the uh, tumor or not. And then, we also detect repeated trajectories on sets of interchangeable mutations. So here we have a set S1, followed by a set S2, and then a set S3. And we can see if it's very likely to move from one set to the next set to the next set, but it doesn't matter which mutation within the set, it just generally moves along these sets. And so our term for this is a pathway of interchangeable mutations, and that's another thing we detect using our model. And finally, we have tree selection, where Clomu assigns probabilities of generating trees, and therefore, given tree uncertainty, we can see for a given patient which trees are the highest probability according to the model, and those are more likely to be the correct tree. The existing methods do not complete all of the tasks Clomu does. Uh, Clomu has a very wide variety of new tasks being completed. So on to results. So first, there's uh, simulations with causal relationships. So in these simulations, there's 500 patients, five driver mutations, five passenger mutations, and a 50% probability of a causal relationship between each pair of driver mutations. And Clomu very accurately predicts causality in this case. In addition to that, TreeMHN also very accurately predicts causality in this case, but other methods do not. Additionally, Clomu performs tree selection better than any existing method. There's an additional set of simulations that I won't go into in detail, but they also have interchangeable mutations added in addition to these causal relationships, and in that case, Clomu uh, outperforms TreeMHN. Another set of simulations uh, observe the effect of combinations of mutations working together nonlinearly. 
So there's 500 patients, two driver mutations, eight passenger mutations, 50% uh, of the causal relationships are uh, causal and 50% are inhibitory. So specifically how this works is the two uh, driver mutations work together to either cause or inhibit other mutations, but individually no mutation causes or inhibit and inhibits any other mutation. This is purely a fact of the two mutations working together. And we can see in this case, we can use our definition of multi-mutation causality to detect this, and CLOMU accurately determines these nonlinear uh, uh, causal relationships, as is shown in this precision recall curve. And as a little side note that I won't go into in too much detail, CLOMU does not falsely attribute this to linear effects of each mutation. So it's not just that A causes C and B causes C, and therefore A plus B causes C. No, it's truly learning only the combination of A and B cause C. It's truly learning this nonlinear effect. Uh, finally, there's simulations with pathways of interchangeable mutations. So CLOMU accurately determines these pathways as well as the interchangeable mutations. So we can see uh, in the histogram, there are dark blue uh, representing pairs of interchangeable mutations and observing the Euclidean distance between those pairs of interchangeable mutations. And in light blue, we have pairs of non-interchangeable mutations, and we're looking again at the Euclidean distance between those latent representations, and we can see it very nicely separates where uh, interchangeable mutations have a very similar uh, latent representation, uh, whereas non-interchangeable ones don't. And additionally, we determine uh, these uh, pathways of interchangeable mutations very effectively, and we beat any heuristic based on existing methods. And finally, we move on to some real data. So on the uh, AML cohort, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, there's 123 patients, and the input trees are inferred using site from single cell DNA sequencing data, and mutations are collapsed to the gene level. On this data, we predict fitness, and you can see there's some mutations that are orders of magnitude more fit than others. We predict latent representations, so you can see some mutations have similar effects, whereas other mutations are very different. So ASXL1 has a very different latent representation than all the other ones. And we also observe causal relationships. So our fitness predictions, predictions are also verified by a totally orthogonal source of prevalence data. So our model is not trained using any uh, prevalence data, it's only trained on the uh, phylogeny trees. Um, and so we observe, uh, define the log prevalence ratio of a mutation S in a patient to measure how large the first clone with mutation S is relative to its parent clone. So as an example, you can look at the blue clone in the tree and the first clone it appears on has a prevalence of 0.5, and its parent clone has a prevalence of 0.1, so it's really outgrowing its parent clone, and therefore it has a high log prevalence ratio, again, a sign of fitness. Uh, whereas if you look at the orange clone, it's much smaller than its parent and has a negative log prevalence ratio, so it's not a sign of fitness. Looking at an individual tree, there could be a lot of noise in this measurement, but if you average across a cohort, you can get a general signal of the fitness of mutations that's completely orthogonal from CLOMU's predictions. And we can see, that CLOMU has uh, predictions of fitness that are nicely validated by this. So specifically, the red line is the fitness as predicted by CLOMU using the tree phylogenies. And in the box plots are shown the uh, log prevalence ratio across a variety of patients. And you can see there's a nice correspondence. And specifically, we also restrict to the set of mutations that occur frequently enough that we have a relatively low noise in this uh, log prevalence ratio. And finally, I conclude. So CLOMU accurately predicts fitness, causal relationships, mutations, interchangeability, and tree selection. The fitness predictions are validated on prevalence data. And there's a lot of interesting directions for future work. So one uh, easy direction, simple uh, thing to do could be to encode, encode germline predispositions as if they were mutations to understand their effects. So we could treat them very similarly as mutations and see do germline predispositions cause, inhibit, affect fitness, et cetera. Uh, similarly, one could encode therapeutics in the same way mutations are encoded, and we could see do mutations affect the rate of different mutations, et cetera, on a clonal level. And with increasing cohort sizes, we can also observe the effects of individual mutations rather than collapsing to the gene level. And finally, I end on a much broader note. Uh, one could imply, uh, apply our kind of general technique of using reinforcement learning to maximize the probability of the data given the model on other problems where there's sequentially generated data and unknown ground truth. So during the question section, I would love if anyone had any interesting suggestions about applying that type of uh, reinforcement learning approach on other types of problems.
And finally, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my advisor as well as the research group members and the source of funding. <laughs>